question about uh, the continuum between rationalism and empathy. Uh, it seems to me that uh, rationalism is one uh, uh, point uh, like uh, at the extreme from uh, uh, affective uh, empathy. Uh, okay. uh, from, uh, sorry. From, acti uh, from active empathy, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in this uh, continuum, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, area, uh, we uh, can uh, find a, uh, um, a place for the speech, for the uh, uh, exchange of uh, uh, speeches and for the words. All this uh, um, element is uh, out of uh, empathy, it before or after, like uh, said Professor Romino, uh, it's instrument for education, for, uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, mm, approach to everything. Could you, could you um, kind of shorten that question? Um, I didn't quite understand it. Uh, yes, my question is uh, about uh, uh, the speech, uh -huh. the words. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like uh, if uh, there is a place uh, for, uh, um, for speech, for uh, uh, the uh, function of the, of the word in the world of empathy. Mm -hmm. or, Speech is uh, out of empathy, or, 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 or before empathy, or, okay. or, or, or after. Oh, so you mean where well, the language is relevant to? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh -huh. and uh, um, another question, uh, and uh, if the, the active empathy it, um, would be a more strong form of empathy, Um. Cognitive empathy is very much based on language, it can be. Cognitive empathy gets two grounds. One of them is immediate perception, and we all do that all the time. So we, in fractions of a second, we can perceive mental states in the faces of other, other beings. But also, the other option is inference, and this is where language is quite important. So we listen to others, and, and we theorize the mental states of those others in our minds. We try and grasp rationally what they might be undergoing. But language for effective empathy is, is something more... Um, it, it's, a, it's a trickier question, because effective empathy is often completely and utterly immediate. But it can be evoked by language, of course. And this is something where literature and arts can play a really important role. Um, Cora Diamond is a Wittgensteinian philosopher who is quite famous in, in animal philosophy too. And her argument precisely is that we should use less rational theory when we discuss other animals and more literature and poetry and arts in order to spark what she calls fellow feeling towards other animals. And so she claims that our meanings in, this, in, the, in the culture, our language games, are quite anthropocentric. It's written into our various meanings and terms and concepts that human beings are more unique as creatures than other animals. And in order to create kinds of fractions in this notion, we need to evoke fellow feeling, which in my opinion comes quite close to effective empathy. And uh, here she precisely uses poetry as an example. So she claims that rational theory cannot do this. Rational theory is completely irrelevant. And instead, we have to try and invite the fellow feeling by various forms of art. And poetry is her example. Sorry, I'm going to forget. Uh, in embodied empathy, the language of body, I think, the, the language of uh, body is very, uh, would be important for the uh, exchange mm -hmm. of uh, mm -hmm. emotions and other... Uh, mm -hmm. uh, of course, of course. Um, but it's not necessary. So, of course, language can make all these forms of empathy stronger, but it can also diminish them. So, there's a mistake in always seeing language as something that clarifies or gives information. Language can, of course, be quite destructive too. It can create muddlements, obscurities, it can distract, mislead. 
And um, so it has a potential role in, in intensifying empathy, but also a potential role in destroying empathy and making it less clear. So um, embodied empathy can quite well flourish without language too. And often language is in contradiction with, with embodied empathy. So a person might say one thing, but we can sense on an embodied level that they're actually undergoing or thinking something completely different. So it's a simplistic example. Don? I think that the this distinction between cognitive and emotional is becoming a bit more difficult now because of research which uh, in one kind of research which is showing that uh, certain kind of cognitive changes are only occurring in a certain emotional state and not in other emotional states. So the cognitive functioning depends upon emotion uh, and, and also that emotion can have an effect on the extent to which there is cognitive change in, in other circumstances. And then you, you, you gave the example of uh, uh, in, intuitive uh, changes, moral decisions based on emotion. Uh, uh, Ninety percent is based on emotion because it's very fast. And some of the things, as you said yourself, some of the things which are very fast are still involving really quite complicated cognitive changes. And so the fact that it's fast doesn't mean that it's not cognitive. So I, I mean, and when I was when I was talking and reading about this, I'm having some difficulty in this distinction between emotional and cognitive. Seems to me they are overlapping more than we previously thought. Yeah, that's an important point, um, and I'm very much with the likes of Martha Nussbaum on this, and, and Mary Mitchley in, in Animal Philosophy when they argued and argued um, 20, 30 years ago that um, we cannot separate reason and emotion; that they are always entwined. And, and um, an, an activist uh, school of uh, philosophy of mind brings this forward too. I think philosophy of mind is now more and more of the opinion that the separation is artificial. But So in that 90% definitely reason can play, play a role too. But what that maps out is the most obvious component. So it doesn't claim that reason is not at all entwined with those emotions, but rather the primary cause of our given moral judgment. So we might have, a sexist might have a feeling of contempt towards women and that contempt can be something that's cognitive, cognitively based in him. But that cognitive basis comes from his culture, his upbringing, his various rationalizations and is secondary in comparison to the primary motive in that instant which is the emotion of contempt. So the two are entwined, but we can still talk of the primary motivation and the secondary. And when it comes to cognitive empathy, it's true that it would be silly to argue that there is any human cognition that is completely and utterly neutral. There's always some emotion there. And in the case of psychopaths, for instance, they do have a rich emotional life. That life just tends to be centered on themselves. So their own loves and their own hates and so forth. And their cognitive empathy can be fed by their loves and their hates or their disgust or their sense of superiority, their hedonism. But where the difference between this kind of um, um, entwinement between reason and emotion and then the term cognitive empathy as something that is detached from emotion comes from is the fact that when we are in a state of cognitive empathy, we might have emotions in us that are linked to the other person, say, but we don't flow with her emotions. So do you see what I mean? It's not her emotive states that are affecting us. So we might have emotions and we are perceiving emotions in her, but we are not flowing with her emotions. And this is the difference. So cognition and reason and emotion are all entwined, but in a state of cognitive empathy, what matters is the fact that we are not paying attention to the emotions of the other, other person on an experiential emotive level. I have a follow-up on that uh, question. So, I mean, 
we argue that uh, cognitive entity uh, is not a good basis for morality because okay, there is no flow of emotion and uh, uh, it could lead to manipulation and so on. But now consider the following case. Uh, suppose that uh, I witness a homicide um, uh, and I see the killer and I see this man, so the killing another person and um, uh, I perceive his fury, uh, the fact that he's angry at the world, uh, that he's come to do this because, um, uh, you know, because of the way he, he lived, uh, which is sort of shown by look at his. Um, so I perceive his fury, his motivation, and my body, it resonates with me, so I turn around and I strike the one who's next to me. Uh, I mean, of course, I wouldn't want to say that, that um, affective empathy or embodied empathy in this case is not a good basis for morality because uh, it can um, lead to this kind of behavior, right? But there is flow of emotion there, and the flow of emotion can lead to uh, wrong moral decisions. So uh, it is not clear to me that the reasons that you give for saying cognitive empathy is not a good basis for morality cannot be also given to argue that um, that effective empathy or embodied empathy is not a good basis for morality. Yeah, yeah. that's a really important question, and of course, I'm not saying that effective empathy or embodied empathy is all that we need. So. This presentation is based on, a, on an article of mine that was published last year, and um, in that I mainly argue with contemporary rationalists who maintain that empathy has no component in moral agency, that it's, it's not necessary for moral agency at all, and not even, not even central and or important. And um, so my suggestion was that it is necessary, and we do need to have these two forms of empathy. But it doesn't mean that reason plays no part, or that reflection plays no part. Of course they do. And effective empathy struggles with various problems. And the other presentation that I was actually going to do today, but decided not to do, um, was on the problems of effective empathy. So, for instance, we tend to feel more effective empathy and embodied empathy towards those that we know the best, who are proximate to us, who are similar to us, who, of whom we have more understanding. And this can lead to various prejudices, and it can lead to um, clear moral um, inequalities and problems. And so definitely not, I'm not arguing that they are necessary, and reflection and reason are very much needed too. The main argument is this, that they are key to moral agents, but next to them, various other factors play a hugely important part. Yeah. 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 Other questions? Uh, yes, over. I want to originally ask something about to, how to learn empathy, but I now want to combine it with a follow-up comment to Don Bloom's question about the distinction between effective and cognitive empathy. Namely, there is now research in cognitive neuroscience. Tanya Singer from the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig is doing a huge project with 200 people that are involved for nine months, having been trained through intervention and through specific apps and many, many different uh, ways in different kinds of social cognitive or social affective uh, abilities. And she separated those modules into be more awareness, more attention, it's one, uh, social cognitive abilities like theory of mind perspective taking, so the cold version of everything, the second. The third one is social affective, empathic uh, intervention. And then they had, uh, I think, 90 different measurements how these interventions over the three, six and nine months have affected their behavior but also their brain. And interestingly, there was a really nice dissociation between the socio-cognitive and the, the socio-affective training. That means that this uh, be concerned with others, so they got stories about others being in, 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 yeah, in painful situations and so on. This kind of training uh, had many different effects 
than the socio-cognitive training, the theory of mind training. So there is a dissociation, also the brain, but also in their behaviors, how they react to other people and so on. So this is really fascinating that these things they come together usually when we when we start with a healthy behavior, for instance, because here we need also to find out what is the situation in which the other, in which context does the other person need help? Is it really helpful if I do this or that? This needs a lot of cold social cognitive abilities. But nevertheless, I need also the motivation, I need the empathy, I need those things. So I think even if we can theoretically uh, uh, disentangle them, uh, nevertheless I think in practice they very often come together. And I'm not in favor of the one or the other side when it comes to morality. I would really like to link them instead too. Yeah, but then, yeah, there's, um, it's true that um, in, in practice, most of these, and there are other forms of empathy too, except these four, they do interlink. And cognitive empathy is really important for us. I mean, we wouldn't survive if we didn't have it. I'm here depicting a, a quite an extreme image of it in order to show its harsher side as well. But of course, it's valuable. Um, but nonetheless, I think even if in practice, all sorts human emotion entwined, not only different forms of empathy, but also different forms of emotion and reason. Even if they do in a specific situation entwine, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't still separate them theoretically, because if we do that, if we do the latter, we might get to the basis of something that tells us um, in greater detail what human morality consists of. So we shouldn't lump everything together too broadly, because that leads to I don't know, it doesn't, I don't think that it enhances understanding necessarily, but of course it's common to them that this is, is and, and there's an interesting, I mentioned psychopaths, there's a um, counter opposite to them, it's called Williams Syndrome, and these people have no cognitive empathy, but a very high effective empathy, and they're absolutely lovely, um, they are the most kindest, caring, empathetic, uh, creatures that you will ever meet. They hug strangers on the street, they want to know what's wrong with everybody and, and they really care for others. But their problem is that they are quite quickly taken advantage of. So they always must have a guardian, even in adult life, they must have a guardian who looks after them because they would keep their house away, they would give all their money away to help others. And one claim is that um, from an evolution theory point of view, when these different forms of empathy, particularly cognitive empathy and affective empathy, have been um, compared, the hypothesis is that affective empathy alone would not make us flourish as a species. We would be too hapless. We would believe everything that others say. And as long as they are the less empathetic amongst us, that means that those creatures will die off. So Williams syndrome is a very marginal syndrome. Perhaps in an ideal world we all would have Williams syndrome, perhaps it would be a better place, but as it stands, cognitive empathy is needed too. Okay, we need to stop here with the question, sorry, but uh, we have to go to the next speaker, who is Ken Shapiro, the last speaker of the morning, even though we are already in the afternoon. <laughs>